Welcome to Science Fiction and Fantasy Network. Today I'm talking to John Leeson. He's a star of stage and screen and also you may remember him as the voice of K-9, the robotic companion from Doctor Who. You were RADA trained, I believe you went to RADA. Oh, yeah, yeah. Indeed, yes. uh, can you tell us a little bit how you got into acting? Where did you first get well, the book? I think I was an actor because I, I always was an actor. There was nothing else I felt I could, I could do. And so I did an audition for RADA back in 1961, I think. Apparently there was something like 4,000 uh, audition candidates Blimey. and only 30 places. And I did probably the worst audition I've ever done in my oh, life. No. I went back home to Leicester and I said, well, that's it. I've wasted journey to London. A oh, great shame, but there we are. Fortnight later, I get a letter back saying that I've been accepted for the course. And uh, so two years at RADO, um, sort of changed my life a little bit. So yeah, you've done a lot of uh, stage as well as screen. Uh, which have you preferred, doing your stage or doing your screen? Oh, yes, yeah. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I think that encompasses both yeah. <laughs> work yeah. with a fee attached, oh, perhaps. Course, you never yeah. know. I was talking earlier on to, to somebody else this morning about the late, great Alan Rickman, who you know instinctively that he was from a theatre background. And there are certain actors that there, there's, there's, a, there's a greater sense of, you get a sort of empathy mm. as a stage actor yourself. So most of my early work was in repertory, and then I did sort of three years and three separate plays in the West End. And then I went and did a lot of comedy, television comedy, including Dad's Army. I was in one of the stories there, which was a completely different discipline, but... Um, and here I am today, very surprised to find that next year, 2017, it will be K9's 40th anniversary. Oh, oh I yeah, yeah, realize yeah. That. Well, yes, mm, I'm afraid I do realise that. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel ancient. <laughs> so tell us about how did you get the role of K9? Had people heard your voice? Uh, well, yes, I, one of the directors I worked with in repertory, a chap called Derek Goodwin. I was walking down my road where I live, down to the pub one evening, and who should be in the pub? Surprise, surprise, Derek Goodwin, who had been directing an episode of Z Cars. Derek said, oh, John, mate, lovely to see you, this, that. Said, what are you doing, anything? Are you busy? So I said, not very. He said, would you like to be? <laughs> so I said, well, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Well, I can't tell you anything about it. I can't tell you, but sit by your phone and um, we'll see what happens. Fortnight later, my agent phones me and says, John, I've just had the most extraordinary call from the BBC. As though my agent never got calls from the <laughs> BBC. They, they were wondering if you're interested in playing not just one, but two parts in Doctor Who. What do you think? Wow, I thought, my accidental meeting with Derek. Gracious, fantastic. What are the parts? Ah, now, John, this is the thing. One of them is the voice of a virus, which I thought would be a tiny, tiny, tiny part. R is this being so very small. The, uh, the other is the voice of a robot dog. What do you think? That, mind you, it's only in for one story. Little did I know. 40 years later. 40 years <laughs> later, well, nearly 39 years later as we speak, but, um, yes, little did I know that K-9 was going to become a sort of icon of 60s, 70s Doctor Who. Well, the K-9 had a lot of issues on set because he was, you know, a rolling little Well, the dog. physical yeah. module as K-9 was always breaking down or, or underpowered or whatever. And, you know, we put a matchstick down on the studio floor and he'd stall. Um, and, in fact, I remember that the, the, the doors of the, the studios... Um, at sets had a tie bar across the bottom and he wouldn't he couldn't cross the tie bar oh, yeah. across the thing. so they had to shoot him as if going through the door from behind and then pick him up on the other side of the door <laughs> having come through it <laughs> so. but you've uh, got over those in big finish you've come back to do him on the audio absolutely yeah. which is wonderful have you found that's given more freedom to the character of course it has of course it has i mean in when you're writing um, sound only, audio only. I mean, you imagine, it's like it's radio broadcasting to a like. 
imagination is wild and you as the listener do all the work of creating the sets and creating I mean and of course the sound design and all but uh, it's it's extraordinary that that audiences seldom realize how much work they're putting into the in, in, into the into the total experience of, of listening to something. What's uh, been your experience of doing the voice acting with no visual cues? Has that just has that been a, a different experience for you? Well, if you if you are the character, you know the character, you know how the character ticks. There is absolutely no problem whatsoever. You just um, play the character in that particular situation. So uh, what are you working on now? What's next for you? Apart from any more big finishes that may come up, as they may indeed. Um, I wear another hat. I'm also a, uh, an accredited wine educator. So I teach uh, wine courses and ad hoc tastings and things like that. And in fact, I sometimes teach on cruises, which is rather nice. In fact, I'm doing one in the summer. Where can people find your stuff? Um, if, they sw- if they're good swimmers, they'll find me um, <laughs> going out to, well, the one I'm doing in, in June is to basically the area around the Loire Valley. We'll talk about Loire wines and then they sail on to Portugal. So I sort of talk about port and Portuguese table wines and things like that. Well, thank you very much for talking to us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Young Vinny, welcome. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>